YouTube. Hi, my name is Mark. This is Nixon Motorsports. This channel is all about motorsports from racing to exotic cars and even simulators. Today's video, I think you'll find this interesting. This is about paddle shifters for race cars. All right, let's get into the video. Come on. Hey, so before I get into this video today on paddle shifters, um, I do need to share and disclose to you some affiliation uh, that Nixon Motorsports has with some of the vendors that I'll be talking about. Um, so the very first one is I, I Nixon Motorsports and I, we do have a, re a commercial re relationship with Geartronics um, and uh, the Ninja supplied um, bottles, carbon bottles, and the paintball related devices, but a lot of those devices are used for fill stations, for uh, carbon in car uh, tanks and so on. So um, we do have a commercial affiliation there. We have a long working um, status and relationship with MoTeC as well, but um, in this video I will do my best to share opinion, experience, um, and lessons learned, and I'll do my best to not inject any bias into uh, what I provide for you. So with that, let's get into the video, come on. So for those of you who do not use or have currently have paddle shifters on your race cars, you know, what are the benefits? Why do you, why do you want to look into this? And it's, it's probably obvious, but uh, um, if you just think about the task of shifting your sequential gearbox today, um, H pattern's a different thing. We're talking about sequential gearboxes here though. With no paddle shifter, um, uh, you typically will have a um, shifter mechanism. You'll have to take your one hand off your steering wheel. You'll actually, in many cases, have to do a um, lift on throttle, momentary lift while you're hitting your, uh, your next gear. Um, you'll have to um, be very aware of, of RPMs on your downshifting and do a small throttle blip to uh, RPM match and such. Uh, on your downshift, so there's you get the idea, right? There's there's a little bit of overhead. Um, modern paddle shifting systems um, remove and eliminate a lot of that, and and in, in addition, add a lot of safety as well. Um, for an example, preventing a downshift when your RPMs are too high, things like that, right? So um, those are some basics on just benefits of paddle shifting. So let me talk about. Um, two basic types of, of paddle shifters um, and more specifically around the, um, the, the system types, right? So you can either have a standalone system, a paddle shift system that you will adapt to your race car and um, standalone paddle shift systems um, will have their own uh, control electronics, call it a GPU uh, and the positive, of course, is that um, you can adapt those systems to to any any race car. Um, the other type, the other type is is an embedded um, package or software firmware um, addition to the ECU that your car is using, and that just reduces some of the need for um, um, well the external GPU and such, you know, for your control of your shifting itself. Um, so that's that's the primary piece for the for the um, uh, kind of the basic control modules. But then there's the two other types of actuator control, and um, we'll we'll get into a lot of detail on this. But um, in basic terms, you have actuators, and the actuator, by the way, is, is nothing more than a device that takes an input and applies force to your gear shifter um, to physically make the shifts, right? So we call those actuators. Two types, you have an electronic actuator and you have a pneumatic actuator. Now pneumatic is pressurized air and that is the, um, uh, the control for that type of actuator. The electric, le electric actuator is, is actually a solenoid um, in the actuator itself that's actually forcing uh, and making movement of your shifter arm. So those are the two basic types, okay? So let me talk about um, um, basic 
paddle shifter requirements and we'll get into system diagrams here in a few minutes too but uh, you know in order you know in order to provide control for any paddle shifting modern system today you have to have a control electronic module um, a, a GPU or an ECU or some electronic device that's actually um, making the decisions and running the software algorithms um, for shifting protocol okay and those device, devices, if you think about it, you know, they have to accept driver input. You know, they need to understand engine RPMs, you know, throttle position, obviously, you know, um, gear position, you know, and control the actuator and so on. And, you know, driver's input requesting gear change, you know, is, is simply the paddle shifters themselves, right? And, and this is nothing more than a signal uh, a signal that is fed to the control electronics requesting either up or down shifts. And um, um, finally, there's the actuator, the gear actuator that does the actual work. Um, so outside of the control electronics and driver feedback, or driver input, excuse me, um, ultimately you have a control module, um, um, an actuator that actually will apply the force on the gear shift mechanism. Okay, that's the basics of, of uh, paddle shift systems. So let me show you a couple parts on the bench. We'll get into a lot more detail here on system, the diagrams, um, how parts work together and so on, and recommendations through this video. But let me pan down and just show you a few um, typic typical items uh, for a paddle shift system. First, let's start with a GPU. So here is here is a, uh, this is a Geartronics model, but this is a, a standalone GPU. So this is that control electronics device that actually um, has firmware and software configuration, but it does all the algorithm and hard work for uh, making the physical shifts itself, right? So that, that's just an example of a GPU. Um, here, let's start here. This, this, and here's a mount for it. This device is, an actuator. So this is a Geartronics again, and this is a pneumatic actuator. And you have about a two-inch stroke here, so this actually controls the shifter arm in your gearbox. And here you have air supply, so you have a um, in and out, or up and down, if you will, um, uh, air supply for the actuator. So pretty small, very very simple devices. Uh, if I pan over here. And I'm not necessarily in one order or not. Uh, this is a fill station valve assembly. And I'll talk more about it here in detail, but uh, just to show you, uh, you know, this would actually connect to a tank and here's your pressure settings. Um, and this would be to your, um, your, your fill tank itself, okay? Next up, you know, I'll, I'll stop and look at this little device. Looks pretty straightforward. Um, this is not proprietary to paddle shifting. This is a um, electronic relay, a solid state relay actually. Um, and this is an example of a device that may be used uh, where you have a standalone uh, GPU, you, you would have to have ignition cut capability for your engine for your upshifts, right? We t you know, that would actually control the um, auto blipping capability, or excuse me, um, the no lift shift capability. So you would need some device like this for that. Here is, kind of, it's in the paper, so hopefully you can see that, but this is a, a valve block. It's a single valve, control valve assembly, um, that when you have actuators like this with just pressure line inputs, you need to have the ability to take an electronic signal and control uh, a pressure line, which is air, uh, either turning that on or off. So that's all this is, it's just um, a valve block itself. And if I pan over here, this is an old throttle body off of one of my uh, ZX10 engines. Here, um, and just focus on this guy, this is a pneumatic blipper. And you can see this mounted here on the throttle body. You can see a, a small little blade added here. And the control electronics provides air pressure. And when it does, this plunger actually will push forward and um, it would actually do a blip for your downshift. So that's all that is. 
I keep going, look over here. Um, this is a pressure, high pressure tank. Uh, just one example of a pressure tank for um, for race cars. Uh, this one, as an example, is uh, rated at 45, 4,500 psi. So these are very high pressure. Um, we'll get into that here again in a few minutes. And panning over here, these are just a couple tanks, um, not for your race car, but these are just a couple example of fill station tanks. Um, if you need. Uh, to carry with you some recharge power or, or air supply for your your car's tank, you know this is an option for you as well. Again, I'll spend more time here in a few minutes, but that's just a few parts quickly. Um, I'll walk through the car um, and I'll show you um, how my install is in my particular race car, which is right here. But uh, first, I want to get through all the details of paddle shifting itself. All right. Okay, so up next, we're gonna get into some system diagrams for paddle shifters. I, I think you'll find this part of interest. So we're gonna focus on uh, pneumatic actuators uh, in these diagrams. And the reason I'm gonna do that is it's the predominant type of paddle shifting system in the market today. Um, and I, I have an opinion on that. I think it's uh, because it's been proven over the years, reliable. Um, the actuators themselves uh, have a tremendous amount of force. And um, so that's why you see so many pneumatic gear shifting systems out there. So that's a high pressure air supply system in your race car uh, for the purpose of shifting your gears, right? There are two basic types. Um, you're going to have um, an air uh, from the air supply system that is you're going to have um, and this first diagram here that we're looking at is a standalone system um, using an air compressor so your race car and what that means by that is um, your race car will have to have an air compressor installed in the race car so if we look at this diagram let's let's just walk through the different pieces of the diagram since I'm talking about air compressors first, let's go all the way here to the right. You can see um, um, the small little air compressor and directly underneath that you see an air tank. So it's an accumulator um, itself. You have to do that. So these small air compressors um, can fit in most sports cars um, and such with not too much trouble. Um, and they'll produce 150 thereabouts um, PSI of air pressure. But with rapid shifts, rapid down shifts, um, you'll need to have, a, have an air accumulator. So that's a small tank that actually is just the receiving inlet. So the air compressor charges this accumulator tank to give you enough air capacity for multiple shifts at one time or, or in very short order. So that's all that is. And, and um, you would need that uh, uh, to handle multiple shifts. The air compressor itself, um, it, looking next to that you see a small relay you from the control elect electronics you would have to be able to of course um, turn on turn off your air compressor and then directly underneath that you can see a pressure sensor so your standalone gpu in, in this example would actually and should be able to monitor the um, downline pressure uh, from your air, air compressor itself does that make sense so if i now focus to the center of this diagram. Again, a standalone diagram. So that means you have a computer, a control module, in this case called a GPU, that is the primary electronic component that's controlling all of your shifting uh, for your race car. And this is a Geartronics example here in the center, but let's look at the different um, I.O. or uh, inputs or outputs and such that this GPU needs to have. Let's start with the steering wheel here to your to your 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 left. I think it is right. So right next to it, you'll see a steering wheel, and that steering wheel is going to have paddles, and that steering wheel, uh, those paddles will be from driver input signaling the GPU. Um, I want to upshift. I want to downshift. Additionally. The driver will need to have two additional um, momentary switches um, 
uh, and and the first is neutral, a neutral switch. Uh, so for some gearboxes that have first, well, gear motorcycle gearboxes is an example. They have what's called a half shift requirement, where between first and second gear in the middle is where you'll find neutral. Um, whereas some other sequential gearboxes uh, in race cars will simply be all the, you know first all all the way up to fifth, sixth, whatever. Um, with no um, neutral in between those gears. Um, so a neutral is needed though, and the control uh, GPU, when it sees a driver input that says neutral, will actually um, move and find neutral, and it simplifies that dramatically, I can tell you. Um, and the last one is limp, limp mode, and Limp mode is another uh, signal input from the driver if you're having uh, some challenges with your uh, gear shifting itself. It's a different mode if you want to think of it that way. Um, and it, it will allow you to get back into the pits. Um, an air compressor based system diagram. Now, we the previous discussion was an air compressor based pneumatic system, but it was the standalone GPU module. Um, in this diagram, this is a, a MoTeC ECU. Think of it as an embedded firmware software package for your gear control algorithm that's actually embedded in the ECU, and that is actually the case. So um, in this example, you do not need to have that standalone GPU to manage your shifting. If you are a MoTeC M1 series customer, uh, you can run either their package or Geartronics or other packages um, in addition to uh, the basic MoTeC software and all of your control logic algorithms for shifting is embedded in the ECU. So it's, it's pretty cool. So if we look at this diagram, um, again, to you know, the, the one side you'll see the air compressor still there, the air accumulator, you know, to generate your air supply, you know, to, to provide enough volume in your accumulator tank for rapid shifts. Um, you'll still have a valve block assembly that's electronically controlled to turn on or off um, an air, air supply for, you know, uh, upshift, for example, downshift and so on. Um, and you're going to have your, your actuator, that's not going to go anywhere. You're going to have your, your gear position sensor and so on. But, but the difference here the gear position, the throttle bodies, the coils, all of those typical engine required signals are already already there in the ECU itself. So there's there's really no additional work on, on that end. Now from this from the steering wheel, you're gonna have the same the, the same driver input and signals, um, like upshift, downshift, um, neutral. Those signals will go directly as line inputs to your uh, ECU, okay? And uh, pretty straightforward. And um, again, it's, it's a pneumatic control system. Now there is no additional software to configure your shifting like, like there was on the standalone. You're gonna use your M-Tune uh, MoTeC software, the same software you use for um, engine tune, right, all your mappings for fuel, uh, timing, etc. It, it's the same software and there'll be a few different um, um, worksheets if you want to think of it that way within M-Tune that is specific for, uh, for your gear uh, control algorithms and so on, okay? So that's the basic uh, system diagram for a air compressor uh, embedded ECU paddle shift system. Okay, so we're going to talk now about, again, MoTeC M1 series um, embedded ECU pneumatic paddle shift system diagram. So the last one we just talked about used an air compressor. And while there are advantages to that, and we'll get into that here in a couple more uh, uh, slides, um, another option is you can provide pressurized air in your race car with a um, high pressure tank in your race car. And that high pressure tank will provide enough volume 
of air supply for your race car uh, for the duration of your 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 race your sessions or so on so this that's all this is now there's the slight difference so you'll have a tank that tank will typically be charged to 3,000 to 4,500 psi so pretty high pressure we'll talk about that here in a few minutes that adds challenges by itself but very high pressure and the output of the tank typically and there can be some variation here but typically they're about 800 psi is is somewhat of the norm and so that that's a still very high pressure itself so in in a um, typical configuration using a standalone tank um, you would want to have a um, an air regulator and you'd want to have an air regulator to downgrade or lower that line pressure uh, that's feeding the air supply to your pneumatic valves. Does that, that make sense? So typically that line pressure will be set at about 150. And um, um, so that's the only difference that you'll see in this system configuration um, using a standalone tank. So let's start with, let's start with flat shifter. Um, so the first two manufacturers will be electronic solenoid or actuators and um, so let's start with flat shifter itself and um, as you're looking at this screen here it, it shows you a couple of my comments and thoughts you'll you'll see a couple diagrams uh, from their website itself I don't have any affiliation with flat shifter um, I would say generally speaking um, they are um, a budget-friendly solution. Uh, some people use them and have, uh, uh, you know, good success with them. Uh, for myself, I had, I had a flat shifter in my race car. Actually, hand down here, my Formula 1000 race car. Um, initially, when I first bought the race car, and I used it, I think, once or twice and it was really uh, not that impressed. I had some challenges with it. Um, the the, it could be just a wore out um, um, actuator or something like that, but it, it, it didn't work very well. So my personal experience, I, I was not that impressed. And when I saw the um, control electronics and the different modules and such, you can tell it was a very, very, but very much a, a budget friendly solution. Okay. Um, you can see here on the, the comment on the bottom of this page, um, you know, are they out of business? <laughs> I mean, I when I was uh, putting this together, I um, I went to their website several different times actually for about a week or so, and uh, their website um, was down or what was not coming up. So since then, uh, I, I've noticed it is back. So um, you know, they probably are in business, but there was an issue on that. There is this company called ProShift, and honestly, I didn't know anything about ProShift. Um, I think they're primarily focused for bike um, bike racers, not um, not cars, not paddle shifting for cars. Um, but uh, anyway, this is Pro Shift. Um, it it also looks like just my observations looking through the website. Um, it looks like it's a, a budget friendly solution. I did not get any pricing to confirm that. Um, I don't have any experience with it either. Um, but like flat shifter, it also is an electric solenoid uh, for the actuator. It's not pneumatic. Um, and again, for um, for bike racers, you know, maybe this is a great solution. Again, I don't know. But anyway, Pro Shift. You can see the uh, the URL there for the website if you have interest. So the next up here for manufacturers, it's Geartronics. Um, you can see the website here. They are a a gear shift, paddle shift solution manufacturer. They've been around for quite some time, uh, 20 some plus years, I believe. They're out of UK and um, definitely a professional grade um, manufacturer. And um, um, they're, not, they're not the budget friendly side, I will say. Um, you know, they, uh, they do carry a price point. They have a lot of expertise, um, good engineering support, uh, and, and so on. But here you can just see a couple examples, um, you know, kind of a picture again from their website showing um, an example of a kit for a standalone 
system with the uh, air compressor and so on. You can see the sample of their um, their software that's the configure configuration software for their GPU and you know the actuator the GPU the valve block assembly here um, as well on the lower side of the screen so Geartronics um, I would say it's definitely in in a strong position I I have used Geartronics now myself for let's see about six years I think thereabouts and um, I have zero zero um, or zero negative if you will um, great products good manufacturer okay so the next one here is this uh, company called Hollinger America and um, they're really not a paddle shift manufacturer <laughs> which is this list that I'm trying to show you but I added them here because uh, I, first of all they they um, they manufacture gearboxes and and so on and, and some ancillary parts one of those ancillary parts they manufacture is an actuator and as you can see here in the diagram um, it's an actuator it it is pneumatic so it's high pressure air but what they've done instead of a second or a separate valve block assembly that your ECU is controlling um, that valve block assembly is part of the actuator itself pretty cool so you only need to have one line, one pressure line into the valve or the actuator and your um, electric signals to control up and down and so on. Looks pretty straightforward. I haven't tried it. Um, it's, uh, it's got a little higher price point than, uh, for an example, a standalone, like, like a Geartronics pneumatic actuator by itself. but. Um, I'm going to get my hands on this and uh, I'll play with it at some point. Um, my, only, uh, my only concern is um, it, you know, size, how, how much bigger is it, uh, will it fit in you know, kind of typical gearbox locations, um, which I'm sure it will, but it's that, those questions. And then the, um, the, last, the last question, and, and it's, it's probably not an issue, but um, you know, having the valve block on the actuator it's it's going to it's going to be or could be in in a heat path um, where it could get heat soaked possibly um, I don't know if that would have any impact on that at all um, I'm sure they've proven this to be totally reliable but you know it's a couple things like that I want to look through and and uh, just verify okay but that's Holland Hollander uh, Hollinger uh, America well the next one here I got to talk about MoTeC now um, MoTeC is known for broad professional um, electronics for race race cars, and you know from ECUs that I think everybody will know. You know from professional data loggers, you know displays, on and on. And they they provide um, first um, ECU support for paddle shifting, and so I've added them to this list. Again, very professional grade company. And in their M ser M1 series ECUs, which is all of their modern new ECUs, you can run and have a um, a gear paddle shift package in your ECU. So that's actually way cool. And on the display here, I'm showing you some kits that you can purchase from Motec, and you can see um, both. Right? They'll 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 sell you a kit with um, a, an air compressor with your, um, um, your paddles to adapt into your steering wheel. They'll sell you, um, you know, a, a, an actuator. Virtually everything you would need to assemble um, a system using M1 ECU as your uh, control logic for paddle shifting. So um, I've been using MoTeC, as I've mentioned now a few times for quite a while. Um, now I do not use just to be clear, I do not use Motex GPRP package, and that is their package that does provide paddle shifting. And I'm sure it works quite well. I I purchased one to be to be honest with you. I just never used it, and I ended up using uh, the Geartronics package in my M1 ECU simply because I wanted the expertise of Geartronics. 
um, to support uh, the algorithms, control features, and so on. So that's it. But otherwise, um, th this is uh, MoTeC, okay? So the next manufacturer is MME Motorsport. And um, I find their stuff pretty cool, actually. I have never purchased from MME. Um, and uh, here you can see their uh, URL for their website here as well. Um, they are out of Eastern Europe. They're not UK. Uh, they, they like Geartronics. They've been around forever. I think it was 20 some odd years. Um, their product set actually looks very comparable. I would say just on observation, this is probably a, a direct competitor to Geartronics. Um, you can buy entire kits as you can see here in this uh, picture. You know, with an external GPU, you know, their pneumatic actuator, valve block assembly, and so on. Um, looks, uh, it looks very, uh, I would say, professional grade. Um, and here you can see at the bottom of the display the, the, um, um, their software that configures their GPU and so on. So um, I'll get my hands on some or possibly a full kit. Um, just to evaluate, but um, anyway, MME, you know, maybe this is one that you want to look at um, uh, for an option for your car, okay? So now I'm going to talk about lessons learned and um, what what works, what hasn't, where have I had issues, and so on. I, I think you'll find this section interesting, so let's get into that. So the very first uh, discussion is around the actuator, the electric actuator. And earlier I talked about that um, a couple different times and you probably got a sense from me, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that. And again, um, it, it from my lessons learned, so the max shifter, um, or excuse me, the flat shifter max that I had in my race car, I uh, had uh, the electric actuator and it really didn't work very well for me. Now I do think, you know, on a positive note, um, you know, they're going to be lower cost, probably can fit in bikes um, a lot easier because you don't have any high pressure air supply. Um, a minimal electrical load on your race car and if you think about that for a minute, um, some race cars, for an example, bike engine race cars, pan down here, like my Formula 1000, they don't have huge um, alternators, electrical systems like like some sports cars may have. So um, on a positive, um, your demand on your electrical system is going to be very low because you have no air compressor for an example and so on. Um, and, and of course you don't need a high pressure air system which is uh, and can be problematic and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But again, you know, kind of from the negative side, um, didn't work for me. I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, uh, if you're looking for professional grade proven, um, long runs, you know, you might not want to go that direction, okay? So, let's talk about pneumatic air actuators and um, let's start first with the positives. Um, it's high pressure air supply, uh, they have a lot of force, they can handle um, reliably your up and down shift needs um, and really robust so ex those are extreme positives uh, I think for for most race cars on the negative side um, a negative side you're gonna have to have high pressure air right and most race cars most cars don't have a big high pressure air system in their cars right so anyway so so you're gonna have two choices you're gonna have to um, you're gonna have to have an onboard air compressor and there's advantages with that in that you don't have to worry about, you know, filling your tanks. Um, you just, it's kind of a turnkey, you just turn your in engine on and go, kind of forget about it. But it does have weight, uh, and I forgot the exact weight of these smaller uh, air compressors, but, you know, even 10, 15 pounds, you know, weight's the enemy of most race cars. Uh, so electrical load is the second on the negative side um, with air compressors. You know, you're going to have uh, 12, 15, maybe 20 amps or more um, drain on your charging system. So you, you need to think about that. The other negative 
um, you could say there's some positives here as well, but the other negative is you have to have a high pressure um, air supply fill station if you're not going to go with the um, if you're not going to go with the air compressor in your car. So there are difficulties, and until you do this, you don't realize some of the challenges. But charging to 3,000 plus psi, um, you know, like a standalone air compressor is not going to do that, right? You know, so your choices are well some talk about you know going to um, paintball locations or go to scuba shops and that type of thing and you know i gotta tell you uh that's that's a pain in the ass um so the other one of course uh, you'd have to obtain your your own high-end um pressure uh pressure supply um like from suppliers like air gas or other um gas supply companies um to provide that level of pressure for charging your tanks, okay? So a little more on pneumatic high pressure air supply for your race car. And, you know, I touched on that a moment ago as well. The positives, there are positives, there are negatives, again. And just trying to reinforce that. So positives, um, you know, it is that install and forget. It really is. Um, and you don't need to deal with going to paintball or you know scuba supply companies or whatever not to fill your tank so there, there is definitely that on the positive side um, on the negative side again reinforcing uh, some of the points I've made electrical load is definitely especially for bike powered race cars you know you really got to watch that um, if you think well most race cars, or I'm thinking about motorcycle powered race cars, that is at least, run the smallest battery they can. And so how is that related, right? Well, when your car is running, your engine's running, um, at idle, your engine's not producing that much current, you know, so you're gonna drain battery even at idle. You gotta get your RPMs up. And clearly, if you're in the pit and you're, um, you, you're you're waiting to get on track you know maybe you have your air compressor come on you're gonna drain you're gonna drain your your car's battery pretty quick uh, so you need to you need to think about that and uh, I would I would say that is in the ne negative side you know and that 10 to 15 pound weight um, added weight to your race car you know irritating right you're just lugging some weight around uh, and then um, I would say negatives as well for the air compressor. You gotta talk about the size a little bit. I mean, they're not huge, and I don't have the dimensions here. Uh, I had one I, I just sold recently, but um, Formula race cars. So I was able to get one in this car, my Formula 1000, but I gotta tell you, that was tough. <laughs> I found a location for it, kind of in the bulkhead area. That was quite quite a challenge to find a, a space and location. Now, if, if it's a sports car, um, you'll you'll have room. You could find room, I'm sure, to mount that. But um, again, it's not just the air compressor. You got to find room for the air accumulator as well. Okay, so so those are the positive pros and, and cons on an air compressor. Okay, so you can tell I like. I think you can tell I like pneumatic paddle shifting systems. They're the way to go. Um, you might be able to tell I like pneumatic high pressure air tanks. That's what this, this discussion's about now. So there's quite a few positives. Let's get into that, but um, about an equal number of negatives. So first of all, just looking at the pictures and the diagrams, these are some examples of carbon carbon fiber tanks for um, for consideration in your race car. And multiple different sizes, um, the bulk of these tanks, in fact all of them, um, that we use and I think most racers use are rated at 4500 PSI um, and you could get them as low as about 50 cubic inch up to about 90 cubic inch of uh, volume. Uh, and there, you can see from a weight point of view, 1.75 pounds to about 3.3 pounds in total weight for these type of tanks. Now these tanks were not made for race cars, they're actually paintball tanks. 
And so that's why we're, we are um, uh, a distributor for Ninja paintball products. Um, we're a race team, right? And we sell components and parts, but um, these are very, very good um, tanks that can be used in your race cars. Okay, so next up, let's talk about um, pneumatic air bo bottles for storage. Not for your race car, uh, but for um, uh, trackside storage. Here are a couple examples um, that I have and use, and I'll show you them here in a little bit, but the, um, the, the, the larger display here or picture is a nine liter bottle, 4,500 PSI. Uh, it, it's, I think it's, yeah, about 550 uh, cubic inch um, volume capacity uh, itself, so quite a bit. Uh, here, the smaller one here is a three liter, uh, about 183 cubic inch itself. Um, so why would you want these? Uh, they're not a requirement, of course, um, but uh, they do come in handy. Let's say you're, um, you're, uh, you're at a venue, maybe it's uh, just a few testing um, sessions, whatever it may be, you, um, you need extra recharge capability, but you don't want to lug maybe a tank around or a charging system. Um, you, you can have these type of fill station tanks um, that are pre-charged and uh, you could use them to fill um, you could you know fill a, a few car, uh, tanks for your race car you know and just kind of put it in, in perspective depends on the size of course but uh, anywhere from one to eight fills um, is is kind of the reasonable range that you can have if, if you have uh, storage tanks like this for you so let me walk over here and show you a couple examples of those storage tanks so um, let me pan down here to the bench. So first, this is a um, a pressure regulator. This is actually used for a high pressure tank itself for filling smaller tanks. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But here are here's two examples of different tanks that we have for um, basically just storage capacity. So this is a, an example of a three liter tank, and here you can see the uh, the uh, um, dial display here is volume. Pretty straightforward, you, you have a coupler here for your line to feed into your, your uh, smaller tank and so on. And here's a, uh, pick it up a little heavier, but this is a, an example of a nine liter. And um, not that big, kind of the size of a scuba tank, if you will. You can get a couple different adapters and fittings uh, this particular one that I have works. I don't really care for it that much. It doesn't give you uh, the drain relief as well as I like to have. But uh, you can see kind of the pressure in the tank. Here's your pressure in your fill tank. And it uh, works pretty good. So those are, those are a couple of examples of, uh, of storage tanks that you might want to consider. All right, so the next one is... Uh, discussion here about uh, fill stations um, and and uh, there's there's some that work okay some that don't in my view but basically two, two choices right so the very first the one I recommend is using a 5k um, nitrogen tank itself and you can see here in, in the yellow tank that's an example I'll show you um, a real setup that we have here in the shop in a minute but um, these tanks you, you'll have to get from from a, uh, a gas supply company like air gas or whatnot and um, they are typically 5k tanks uh, that's 5,000 uh, psi pressure they are heavier than shit just letting you know that excuse my language um, and um, you need to have a fill valve assembly um, that does have the CGA 677 adapter um, for this to work. And now look, from a positive point of view, your fill time's extremely quick. You have zero issues. Um, and you can fill typically, uh, I haven't timed it, but around 30 seconds. Basically, you go, you go to, the, uh, to the tank, you, you energize it, you watch your your dial pressures and such, and before you know it, you're done. So I'll, I'll show you an example here in a minute. Then, then the other option is you, you use um, fill charge stations themselves. So 
These are portable fill stations. Um, here's a couple examples of them. Um, we'll do a demo here in a minute so you can see that. Um, I do have one of these here in the shop. Basically, these are air compressors that are able to upcharge um, you know, to 4,500 PSI, about 300 bar. Um, and they are liquid cooled and uh, noisy for the most part, or can be. And some require um, air compressor inlets, um, others don't. But um, those are a couple examples, you know, and I obviously I, I've, I've, I've talked about the tanks a little while ago. Um, so I'm not going to go back on the tank side, but those are examples that you need. Now, I tried fill stations. Uh, I have three or four of them. That's how I approached it initially when I decided to go paddle shift and go uh, pneumatic. And I got to tell you, I, 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 was, I was able to race. I didn't have any failures from that point of view, but I was constantly playing with, the, um, with these portable fill stations. Um, they are typically running constantly, you know, so kind of in the pit or in the garage, you're hearing this loud, uh, you know, kind of air compressor noise running constantly. And um, I, I, I found them to be problematic uh, from a reliability point of view. So I, I, I always had a couple of them. And um, anyway, so they do, they, they do work, um, but noisy and from a reliability point of view, I personally I think you know it's a it's a uh, it, it's a concern. So if you're going that path, I would recommend uh, for your pits, your race car setup, your shops and such that you have at least two. Um, so you have a backup uh, charge station just in case you have a failure on that one. Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of filling tanks. I think it's a it's a good exercise. So this first one, so I'm gonna use the same tank here. Here's a Ninja, a Ninja tank, again, 4,500 PSI. Uh, I believe this is the uh, 68 cubic inch, I believe. Um, here you can see a small, a small pressure dial on the valve assembly, okay? This is your fill port here. And let me open this up, I can. This is your, your fitting this is where you would adapt into your race car. So this is your out, output, um, and you have a valve assembly that screws onto this, and when that's open, it's set at the, it's set at the line pressure um, by this device right here, okay? So anyway, this is the, a typical tank that you use. So let's take this over. First up, let's talk about, and let me show you that high pressure nitrogen tank and how quick and easy this is to fill a nitrogen bottle, right? So let me let me pan down here. So this is in our race shop. Here's an example of a 5K uh, nitrogen tank. Here's a fill valve assembly. So that here's that adapter I was telling you about. You have two different pressure dials. You have one that's the tank pressure. The second is going to be your fill tanks pressure. And this is a valve to um, um, uh, discharge this pressure into your tank, your, your fill tank. Uh, so those are important. But let me go ahead and, and uh, wire this thing up and then uh, turn this on. So just a second. Okay, so I've plugged in with this stainless cable into the uh, car's tank. And here's my large tank. So first thing is open up the valve here. And as you look at these valves, you can see here is showing you the pressure in the tank, the storage tank itself. And then this is this is for the tank that I'm filling. So first up is I I turn this valve. See where I pressurized, and you can hear it. Maybe you can hear that. And so it's going through this line here into this tank, and I can watch this dial here as well. Not sure how accurate these are, but uh, they're they're a good reference uh, dial for the tank. And then here's the pressure uh, for that tank as well on this side. So, you know, I'm I'm getting close to 3,000 psi already. Very 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 quick. So, to turn it off, you simply turn your 
close your valve on your main tank. Okay. Lastly, this is still energized, so what I'll and you can see pressure here. So what I'll do is relieve this valve, and you'll hear it. Right? You don't see the dial go away, but you heard it de-energize, and you can see the line uh, break down. So at that point, I can simply, I can do this with one hand. There we go. Basically, I just remove this coupler. And now I'm back to my tank. And I can tell you it's energized. This thing is quite warm. Um, if you fill these too quick, um, you, you, you should be a little careful and not go crazy on, on how quick you fill, but they get warm very, very, very quick. Um, and that's not a problem. That's just because the amount of um, air supply that's uh, running into these tanks. Okay, so that is a quick example of filling from a nitrogen storage tank to your in-car tank. Okay, so now I'm going to show you an example of charging or filling your car's tank with one of these uh, fill stations. Um, so let, let me pan down here at the track and in the shop. This is just one example of a small little portable fill station. Um, pick this thing up. I've only just barely turned it on. I couldn't tell you. Uh, how well this works or not we'll find out here in a minute right so i have it um i have it plugged into a new bottle um and this is a tank of water that you need it's got a small little um water pump inside there so it's running water through through this unit so uh, let's go ahead and just turn it on let's see what it does okay downline pressure goes away so we'll let that thing sit there just for a minute <laughs> so that's a sample right of a fill station and uh, you know just for that minute of doing that I'm there so do they work yeah noisy is H um, reliable from a reliability point of view I would probably well I, I know for the ones that I've used I've had challenges so anyway just wanted to show that example so let's talk about drive-by-wire with paddle shifting and um, first before I do that or while I'm talking to you let me pan down and show you a couple examples of throttle bodies so this first example these are off uh, ZX10R bike motors by the way this first example of this throttle body is a throttle body where the driver input will change the blades directly right so typically it's a cable uh, from your throttle um, your pedal directly to um, this wheel and that is a direct um, throttle pedal right to the blade control directly right and so 
that is non-drive drive by wire, right? It's it's direct as I mentioned, and these in this example, this is where you would have a blipper uh, that would actually be controlling this mechanical blade, and you would have to do that because the ECU does not have any control of the throttle bodies or blades directly themselves, right? So if I pan over here, so this is an example of a drive-by wire throttle body, again, from a ZX-10R, and this is a driver input, so that same cable from your pedal to this pulley, if you will, um, it does not control these blades directly. In fact, if I moved it while I'm doing this with one hand, but anyway, yeah, this does not move. There's no relationship between your input here and the blades. So what happens, the driver input is here. There's a sensor that is measuring input from the driver. That's simply a sensor that goes to the ECU. Now the ECU then controls, this is a servo motor, a electric control drive motor. That is the drive motor that controls these blades directly. And on the back side, the back side of this throttle assembly, here's your uh, TPS or your position sensor itself so it knows where the blades are. Um, so that, that's a kind of a typical drive-by wire setup, right? So, um, you know, a standalone, um, you know, hopefully that helps you understand that, right? A standalone uh, GPU or a non-drive-by wire um, paddle shifting system, you're going to have to have that auto blipper, um, that mechanical action on your throttle body. Um, if it's a, a, an M1 ECU example where your, your paddle shift software package is in the ECU, um, you, you don't need to do that. Now let's talk about back down here. Let me look at these, these two throttle bodies one more time again, side by side. So, um, a challenge you can have with drive-by-wire um, if you are not running a software package in the ECU, the ECU is controlling your throttle blades directly. And if you had to adapt an external blipper to this input shaft, you could do that. So it's not that you can't do that, but you need to keep in, in mind that mechanical action here requesting a downshift may or may not perform exactly as you were thinking because you have the ECU and its algorithm that is that is in direct control of those throttle blades directly, okay? So that is one thing you'll need to keep in mind and consider um, between drive-by-wire and non-drive-by-wire for paddle shifting. So. Next up, now we're going to talk about what my setup is in my race car. I'm going to talk to you about um, the different components that I have in place. I'll walk around the car. I'll show you what I've done, okay? So first up, you know, as we look at this diagram here, let's just get into it very quickly. So it's a Formula 1000 race car. It's a bike engine powered race car. I happen to run a 2022 ZX-10R motor. Uh, again, it's a bike engine. And my setup, I use MoTeC all throughout my race car. And my ECU is a MoTeC 150. And I use the Geartronics package. Um, and that's basically their firmware, if you think of it that way. I use the Geartronics package in my M150. And uh, that's not the GPRP MoTeC package. Uh, just to be clear. In my setup, I use um, modern, you know, drive-by-wire throttle bodies. Um, my paddle shift control uh, from my steering wheel is direct I.O. into the ECU itself. The ECU, the M150, controls the pneumatic valves for up and down shift. Um, the ECU controls the auto blipping, um, all of those parameters um, directly since it is a drive-by-wire. The ECU, ECU um, monitors uh, pneumatic line pressure and so on. So um, in addition to that, 
I do use, and I could use other components here as well, I, I do use the Geartronics uh, pneumatic actuator, and, um, and I do use the Geartronics uh, pneumatic control valves um, to drive the actuator. And so the ECU itself is interacting and controlling the control block assembly um, directly. And in addition, I have a air regulator that um, is, is downgrading or, or reducing the, the line pressure to 150 PSI uh, from the tank's output, which is 800 PSI. I use um, Ninja paintball bottles. I use a 4,500 uh, PSI 68 cubic inch, I believe it is. Um, tank that I charge and fill with my HBA nitrogen high pressure tank. So that is uh, the basic setup that I have in my race car itself. Okay, so let me let me walk around the race car and I just talked about my setup. Let's get in here and, and just roll around and look at what we have in place. So again, this is a Formula 1000 if it's the first time you've seen this. ZX-10R engine driving a uh, diff, a chain-driven diff. Um, if I go down here close enough, so here is my pneumatic actuator, right here you can see it. Here's my two pneumatic lines that feed it directly. And if you look all the way down there towards the bottom where I'm kind of pointing, you can see, in fact, right here, there is the, um, they call it the J-arm, but it's the shift lever mechanism that drives the gearbox. So, so that's the actuator. If I roll up here, here's where I've mounted my valve block assembly. So this is actually a three valve block assembly. I'm only using two of them for up and down shift because this is a drive-by-wire throttle body engine. The ECU is controlling the um, auto blipping, um, all of that directly. So I, I only need two valves, okay? So if I roll forward, let's go in the cockpit. So if I look at my steering wheel, not sure if you can see them here, but roll up this way. So here's my downshift paddle. You know, here's my upshift paddle. And um, those, those paddles um, are a direct input to the ECU. You know, for an example, like here's my neutral button and so on, okay? If I take the steering wheel off, bear with me. So if I take the steering wheel off, get in here a little closer. So I got this kind of just set over the side here at the moment, but this is my, it's small. This is my air regulator. So this takes uh, 800 PSI in from my air tank that I have mounted up front under my legs, not the most ideal spot, um, but it takes that. It then uh, um, regulates its output to 150 for line pressure. And that line pressure back here to this valve block is my air supply input for the valve block assembly itself. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, let me talk about let me talk about a couple just tidbits that I've discovered over over time, right? So let me pan down here and show you. So this is the actuator itself again. You can see here where it's on a mount goes up against the engine. One thing to keep in mind when you're when you're installing your actuator, make sure it's as perpendicular as you can from your mounting point to where your shift lever is. Um, you you don't want any binding. You don't want any binding in the shaft. Now look, these pneumatic actuators have a lot of force and pressure, um, but it, it would be a wear item, and it just it just takes away a little bit of its. Um, um, capability in driving the, the gear change. So make sure it's free um, in alignment and make sure that your um, your throw, your travel on the J-arm through the actuator um, is is 50%, uh, right? So you want the up and down shift, that length to be, you know, right in the middle um, and you know, pretty obvious. Make sure you do that. Now, I use I use uh, 4AN airlines. Let me go down here and show you. So I use these these 4AN lines. 
for my air supply. You could get away with 3AN. I think some, some folks do. I just wanted to make sure that uh, volume uh, was, was not an issue. Now, another, another tidbit, you should keep from your valve block assembly to your actuator, keep those lines um, as short as you can. And you want to try to have the line length equal. So you, both your up and down um, request to your actuator, the, the pressure from those, that valve block is going to be the same. Okay, so those are, are good, good to have as well. Um, I would say from a, from a spare parts point of view, pneumatic actuator controlled paddle shifting systems, um, I would say a couple spare parts you should keep in mind. Um, a spare valve block is a good idea. You have some O-rings and seals there that uh, if they leak, that's a problem. Um, a spare actuator, um, I would suggest, they're not that expensive, probably keep a spare actuator laying around. And, um, and, and that's about it from a uh, spare part point of view. Pretty, pretty simple. Hey, so I know we're talking paddle shifters today, right? And, uh, but I gotta pause here for a minute. So who is this? This is Grace. This is my sister's sister. No, this is Grace. She's from Australia. She's Jane's sister. She flew all the way out here to spend some time with us, give us a hard time. Wanted yeah. to come out to the racetrack. Yeah. They've been watching, supporting, following this channel and what we do for forever. Yes, absolutely. Long time. Yeah. yeah. And um, what's the pit crew? A long time. Ago. Yeah. So yeah. you know, Grace, Warren, you know, the kids, you know, yeah. they they've been at the runoffs with us before, and they've yeah. experienced all this kind of stuff. So that was in Kansas City. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, just a quick little call out. You know, say hi to Grace, Warren. Hi, honey. Hi, you, uh, Australia. <laughs> what the kids? And, you know, Steve, Dylan, and my honey. Hi, hi Steve. It takes us a minute. We're a little foggy, all this work, everything we've been doing. So, uh, um, yeah, it's kind of warm, it's, but it's cool. It's really good. Anyway. Thank, thank you for having me. Back right. to the video. Thanks, guys. So a long video, a lot of detail. I hope you found this of interest. Um, paddle shifting is not that complicated. Um, filling pneumatic systems uh, with high pressure in your race car, you can chase your tail on that and that could be um, a frustration. Um, so however you do it, whatever parts you use and so on, um, I would recommend paddle shifting for anybody though. It's a huge performance advantage um, and um, highly recommended. Um, again, Thank you for watching this video. If you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. Um, we're almost to 500 subscribers. I know that's not very much. Uh, our channel's relatively new. Um, we're trying to focus on new content, uh, more um, instructional level detail, uh, sharing some of what we do directly on our race car. Um, but tell your friends about the channel. Um, and uh, any comments, of course, are very welcome. We encourage that. So. That's it for today, and uh, until next time, okay? Ciao.